In this video, I'm going to take you through all the labs I did as an electrical engineer in college. Now, most of my classes had labs, and usually it was about one per week. So I did over a hundred labs in college and obviously cannot go through them all. But a lot were very similar, so I'll kind of group those together, then share some of the more exciting ones. Labs were also not the hard part of the curriculum. I mean, they aren't easy, but these are not what make people drop out or anything like that. So just use this video to get an idea for what you could build and see if you have an interest for the major. So my first real labs were circuit analysis labs. We didn't build circuits that looked like this, but we used large cables like these and large resistor or capacitor boxes like these where you can see where the red and black cables plug into. So you may have a lot of these boxes which are resistors and they'd say make a circuit like this. Take voltage measurements at different places and see if it measures what you'd expect. Nothing too exciting, but you gotta learn the basics of connecting and measuring circuits. Then we got to AC circuits. That's when we threw in capacitors and inductors. Still those large cables and boxes, circuits were more complicated, but we still just measured voltages and currents throughout. Here we really got into learning how to use an oscilloscope, which is probably the most important piece of hardware you use in college. As you can see, a sinusoidal voltage appears, which is what is in an AC circuit. Hardware like this can tell us the voltage for constant voltage circuits where you touch those red and black cables to where you want to measure and it pops up on the screen as you can see. But these aren't quite as useful for alternating voltages even though you can use them, but it's much nicer to see the voltage in time. So we'd be given some circuit with various components and we might have to measure the phase difference between the resistor and capacitor. We'd have to zoom in on the oscilloscope and take measurements in the difference in time between the two waves. Or they might say run different frequencies for your input voltage and see how that affects the phase difference. Again, it's still just measuring voltages and currents and getting used to it all, but the circuits are getting more advanced. In my power lab, we did nearly the same thing but with high voltage circuits. These circuits were usually around 100 to 250 volts, which was high enough that the professor was required to check the circuit before we could turn on the voltage. The equipment looked different, but really it was just about making mostly resistor circuits with high voltages and you took measurements of voltage and power at different parts. Everything was pretty similar except for that we got to work with an electric motor for a few labs. We applied different alternating voltages to the motor in which you see three different ones here just out of phase with each other, which induced a magnetic field which in turn turned the motor, which you'll learn the theory behind in the lecture. The machine would tell us the rotations per minute and we did tests on how different frequencies would affect the motor and what the torque on the motor was and so on. In my first electronics class, we finally used a breadboard for the first time. The beginning laps were mostly diode circuits, but towards the end we got to make an amplifier circuit in which we were given the circuit schematic, which you should not worry about now, but had to determine the resistor values like R1, R2, and so on that would make it amplify our signal by let's say a factor of two or get twice as big. We'd make predictions, build the circuit, and then test that everything worked. In my digital electronics lab, it was all the same, but with circuits that had a purpose of turning high voltages into low voltages or vice versa. But there was more to it than that. For example, our oscilloscope may have looked like this, and you can see they're switching from a low to high voltage. But if you zoom in, you see it's not instantaneous. It takes some time, and we had to analyze why that was and how to lower it if possible. Lowering that transition time is one thing that could make our computers faster. So we might build the circuit that changes 5 volts into 0 volts, the circuit itself not shown here, and look at that transition time. But then we may attach two more of the same circuit, and the output will still be 0, but then the lab report may ask of something like how is the transition time affected with multiple circuits. In my analog electronics class, it was all amplifier circuits. Different ways to build an amplifier, to amplify voltage, amplify current, we strung multiple amplifier circuits together to make a large amplification, and so on. And this isn't the only kind of amplifier circuit, by the way. We built a variety that all had their differences, and it was all about measuring the amplified voltage or current, and picking which resistor values would achieve what we needed. In my signals lab, we started applying many different types of signals into simple circuits. One lab was to test the response of a resistor capacitor circuit to various inputs. So we had this really simple circuit and we put in a square wave, a sawtooth wave, and a sine wave and measured the output. In a previous video I showed how if you add many sine waves together you can get a square wave or anything else that you want. 
So in this lab, we were essentially showing mathematically that if you put a square wave, for example, into the circuit, it's like putting all of those sine waves in at the same time. And the equipment we were using, called the spectrum analyzer, could break up the wave into those sine functions. I know this is a little confusing, but just realize for some of these labs, there's more beneath the surface than what I'm showing. In my electromagnetism course, the lab was probably not what you would think. The lab was all about learning transmission lines, and not the transmission lines that carry power to our houses. These are special cables that can carry high frequency signals like cable television, radio, or even some computer network connections. We need special cables for these because normal wires you use in other labs could not sustain high frequency and you'll learn why in the curriculum. This lab is kind of hard to explain as well, but in high frequency circuits there is reflection and transmission. Just like a rope traveling through some new medium, which isn't really shown here, but some will reflect and some will transmit through. Well in transmission line circuits, voltage will also reflect back and some will transmit through the circuit. We learned how to use a vector network analyzer, and this was the last piece of hardware I learned in college. And this is kind of like the oscilloscope for analyzing high frequency signals, but at the same time it's much different. And this tells us essentially how much reflection and transmission occurs in the circuit. That's really all we cared about. This may seem kind of odd, but this lab was not about designing an amplifier, filter, transmitter, or anything like that. It was just about testing how a resistor or capacitor or open circuit or something simple would reflect and transmit a signal. Nothing too design oriented. Then I got to my embedded systems class and finally I started doing more labs that made me feel more like an engineer. Up until this point it's a lot of just measuring voltages and currents and analyzing signals, but I never actually made anything. Well, in this class, the first lab was to make an LCD display Hello World using a microcontroller. Then we had to make a function generator, where your project had three different buttons, and each one you press outputs one of three different signals. You'd have an oscilloscope where you plug in your output, then one button should make a square wave, another a triangle wave, and the other a sine wave. Then if you press the same button twice, it changes the frequency of whichever one that you're on. This class is a combination of programming and circuit analysis. Simple projects usually look something like this, but they did get more hectic. But you have your circuitry on the right, then the microcontroller on the left which you program and tell it what to do based on the inputs. For our function generator project, looking back at a lab report, we had about 150 lines of code, which is nothing too crazy. I had bigger coding projects in my first programming course. So it's not super heavy programming or circuitry, but you encounter both and combine them by using the microcontroller for these projects. Then our final project was to buy a sensor and make a project with it. It was up to you. For my project, we got a light sensor and made a light sensor alarm clock that was programmable. So basically you could set how much light you wanted that would cause the alarm to go off. One group made an automatic dog feeder that would release food from a device based on the weight of food remaining in the bowl. And one group made a temperature controlled fan where they used a temperature sensor that would turn a fan on or off based on the temperature outside. Then my final year I had an electronic design class which had just one lab that would take the entire quarter to finish. Our project was a wireless lux meter which measures how much light there is in the room. This was a fun project and there was a lot of stages to it. We had a sensor that produced a certain amount of current based on the light it was picking up. Then we used that current to create a voltage that would charge up, then shoot back down and continue on, which I've shown before. Then we changed that into a square wave, and you learn all these techniques to manipulate the signals like this in the class. We were given a transmitter to transmit the signal wirelessly. Then we amplified the received signal, filtered out unwanted signals and noise, then printed the value to the LCD in which we had to use a microcontroller like in the embedded systems class. So this used a little bit of everything. Signals, wireless communication, microcontrollers, circuit analysis, electronics, etc. If you've seen my other video on EE Labs, I say how circuits are often built in stages, and this is what I'm talking about. There were a lot of things that had to happen all kind of separately, then we combined it all into one. Now on to some of the elective classes, which will probably be your most interesting labs. These will differ for everyone, but here were some that I took. First was Digital Signal Processing, which was one of my favorite courses. The labs all involved programming, specifically with MATLAB for those who know it. No circuits or hardware. But we used programming to digitally filter and manipulate signals. This was a math intensive class as well. 
One of my favorite labs included a telephone touch tone decoder. Every number on a phone has a certain tone or sound associated with it when you press it. So the professor gave us a half second digital sampling of the signal and asked us to use filtering techniques to determine which button was pressed. The hard part was that he included noise into the signal, as in just random changes in the signal to distort it, which made it harder to interpret so we had to filter out that noise. Another cool one was to make a programmable equalizer. You've probably seen an equalizer before on the computer. Basically you have various frequency ranges and the program had to be able to amplify or reduce specific frequencies based on what you told it. So it could reduce higher frequency sounds but not lower ones or whatever it is that you wanted to do. I took a wireless communications course and the big project was basically design a radio receiver system. So we were given the antenna which would pick up the radio signals and a speaker where the sound would come out. Then we had to design basically everything that would happen in between. We had an amplifier right before the speaker that we could adjust with a knob to change the volume. There was a filter that removed unwanted frequencies from other wireless devices. We had to implement a mixer, which is a little tougher to explain, but FM radio stations like 94.5 FM are at 94.5 million hertz. The maximum frequency humans can hear is about 20,000 hertz. So if you just put a radio signal through a speaker, you'd hear nothing. We cannot hear remotely that high. So to kind of simplify this, the mixer moves the frequencies down to ones that we can hear. Why are radio waves high frequency to begin with if we just got to move them down anyway? Because they need to be to be sent wirelessly, which you'll learn the theory behind in your communications course. There was also a second narrower filter to then remove unwanted radio stations and really close signals. And there were some more, but I don't want to go into too much detail. In the end, it was cool because we could adjust the mixer just by pressing buttons, and that would change what radio station we heard out of the speaker. Each week of the lab was characterizing one of these components and doing tests on them, then at the end we put them all together for a final project. I took a filter design class in which we had to build various types of filters. Like this filter here I've shown before that only allows a certain range of frequencies to pass. Maybe it's for a radio and it's only allowing 94.5 FM to play. So it goes up to 94.6 and down to 94.4 to allow that small range of frequencies from the station. But everything else is blocked. Or maybe there's a circuit that allows lower frequencies but blocks higher ones, as you can see as the filter begins to go down. But there are many ways to make the filter sharper using circuit techniques. We were told your filter has to be this sharp and allow these frequencies to pass and we were given the components and then had to design the circuit that would result in the response we wanted like the one shown above here. Now there were some more labs I didn't include like controls which was about analyzing types of responses to voltage inputs or digital design which was about building logic gate circuits but hopefully this gave you an idea of what you're going to encounter. And also labs typically had pre-labs where we had to design the circuit on the computer. Yes, there is software, P-Spice and or LT-Spice are probably what you'll use where you can make the circuit and see all the currents and voltages anywhere in the circuit. The labs will actually be making those circuits and then testing them with equipment. Now something I want to note, when I entered electrical engineering I thought I'd be making those wireless lux meters and radio receivers and those more interesting projects much sooner than I did. It takes some time to get to those projects, and you notice how in the beginning you really focus on building circuits, measuring voltages and currents, learning the equipment, and so on. But you don't use those circuits for much until later. For projects that are more large scale and maybe what you imagine with engineering, join engineering clubs and get involved with extracurriculars. It wasn't really until the end of my third year that I felt more like an engineer who could actually make things. Up until then, it was just measuring voltages and circuits. It takes some time, but you'll get there. I hope this cleared things up. If you have any questions, comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.